God, our Father in heaven, wants to give you something that nobody can steal. I'm David, this is March 4th, and we're on week number 89. I'm glad you could join me. In 60 seconds, here's what I mean. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Christians in Galatia, wrote this in chapter 3, verse 29. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. When he talks about an heir, he's talking about the future. God has a future planned for every person that is in Christ. That future involves the Holy Spirit being with you while you're on this earth. And also the promise that's referred to a little bit back in chapter 3, that God will bless the nations of the earth through his people. It's quite a contrast from the life that Solomon was talking about in Ecclesiastes when we read things like there is no hope after the grave, or you die and that's it, or all life is meaningless. What the world can't take away is your future in Christ. Stick around if you want to hear more. One of the huge messages that I walk away from after reading the scriptures this week and talking to the Lord about it is the contrast between Solomon's relationship with God and Paul's relationship with God which is also a contrast between the old covenant, which was based upon the law and obeying the law to be made right with God, and the new covenant, which is based upon faith in Jesus Christ, which fulfills the law and leads you into a future. Throughout Ecclesiastes, in these last few chapters, uh, 10, 11, and 12, we see all sorts of statements that lead to a sense of hopelessness, Over and over, Solomon declared, life is meaningless. Everything we do is meaningless. He said things that directly um, contradicted what was written in the New Testament, things that Jesus himself would say and do. Chapter 10, verses 5 and 6, Solomon says this, There is another evil I've seen under the sun. Kings and rulers make a grave mistake when they give great authority to foolish people and low positions to people of proven worth. I wonder what Solomon would have thought when he recognized the presence of God himself in Jesus, who had all authority in heaven and earth, and yet took the lowest position, born in a manger, and came here to save a creature, human beings, that, you know, some people would have thought are beyond redemption. In chapter 10, verse uh, 14, Solomon declares, no one really knows what's going to happen. No one can predict the future. Yet when you look at Revelation and you look at the things that the New Testament uh, believers were declaring, there is such a thing as prophecy. There is such a thing as predicting the future in the Holy Spirit. And there is such a thing as knowing what's going on. As a matter of fact, um, Scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit reveals all things to God's people. Jesus himself said the Holy Spirit would come to teach us, to convict us of sin, to teach us what we don't, didn't know, and to remind us of what he's already taught us. Now, I view of uh, what Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes is a man who was searching for the meaning of life. And, you know, if you look at uh, chapter 7, he declares in verse 28, I have not found what I was looking for. He was looking for something outside of God to satisfy a need inside of his life that only God can satisfy. He ran after drugs and alcohol. He ran after great accomplishment. He buried himself in his work. He buried himself in foolishness. He did all sorts of things trying to figure out why people are here and what it is that God wants from us, which is very interesting. You know, the root of his life basically says, I believe in God. But the God that he had was a God who, who was visible to him at one point in his life. He, the presence of God filled the temple that he built, that his father David had set him up to build. Solomon had everything good going for him. His father was a man who loved the Lord with all of his heart, mind, soul, and strength. And he was handed a kingdom of Israel. But that visible presence of God that filled the temple and the visitation of God in Solomon's dream, um, giving him wisdom to rule the nation, eventually that fire starts to wear off because Solomon, remember, is under the old covenant. He's under the old deal. He's under the Old Testament. And 
Jesus hadn't yet come. So every person in the Old Testament had a relationship with God, and they were allowed glimpses of the future. And in this case, in Solomon's writings in Ecclesiastes, you find a mix of a whole lot of hopelessness and depression and meaninglessness. Um, and then every once in a while, there's glimmers of hope that shine through, like he really does understand. He made multiple statements in the last few chapters, for example, about how everybody is going to be judged for the things that they do on this earth, for good or for evil. So he had a belief in God that was there was a finality there. He also said you can't argue with God about destiny. <laughs> he created us. You're not going to change his mind. Um, the one thing we have in that is that we have the freedom of choice, and we don't know what our destiny is in God. So choose wisely, live wisely. As you're reading uh, through these last three chapters, there was, there was all those things that I pointed out already that just seemed to be like, why would you say that when that's not true? But he doesn't, he doesn't know Jesus. He didn't have the Holy Spirit the way we do. The Holy Spirit may have come upon him at times, but to have the Holy Spirit in you, to have this revelation of, of God being near us, Emmanuel, God with us, um, which happened when Jesus came, it was totally different than the experience that they walked with. If they were going to have that God with us sense, he would have had to have walked with a closeness to the Lord that rivaled what his father David had done. The things that God gives us through him being near to us cannot be taken away. The world can do a whole lot of things to try to crush your hope, crush your faith. They try to wipe out the history. They try to rewrite history. They try to make it so Jesus never existed. But in the end, every person is going to have to come face to face with him. There's no escaping it. They will, every person who lives on this earth has been given life by Jesus and we will stand before him. Um, either he will be our judge or he will be our savior. It depends on what you decided to do with him while you're here on this earth. So my advice is, uh, it echoes what Solomon said at the end, because after, after, at the end of chapter 12, um, or at the end of all of his writings here about Ecclesiastes, he has chapter 12. And in chapter 12, he starts it just before that. He says, remember, you must give an account to God for everything you do. Even though this guy had 900 wives, had all sorts of idolatry going on, had all these paths that he took in life that were really destructive to himself. He wrote down the result of everything and declared that it was all meaningless, every single bit of it. But underlying all of that was the belief, the strong belief that God is real and he requires an account of the way we live our lives. So chapter 12 is kind of interesting. Because in the beginning, he says, don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your creator. Honor him in your youth before you grow old and say life is not pleasant anymore. Now, he's, he's struggling with depression and the meaningness of, meaningless, meaninglessness of life. Um, but still, you can't deny the fact that God is real. And in the New Living Translation, they inserted this phrase, remember him, talking about God. Remember him. Remember him, remember him, remember him, remember him six or seven times right here because it's a really long run-on sentence and you might lose the fact that the exhortation at the beginning was turn your life towards God. Turn your life towards the Lord. And what happens here at the end is he says, this is the, he says, that's the whole story. Here now is my final conclusion. Now, this is a man without Jesus. Okay, without any belief in eternal life or anything like that. But this is what he says. Fear God and obey his commands, for this is everyone's duty. God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. This is the legacy and the ending of the God who is distant and far away. This is the old covenant. This is God is all powerful. He is our judge. You obey him and you fear him because that is the aspect of who he is. And there was a terror when God would appear at random times, or not random to him, but random to us. Random times throughout history is recorded in the Bible. There was a terror. There was a death sentence for getting too close to him. That would terrify people today, right? So, but what changed was that Jesus Christ came. And you remember the declaration of the angels at Christmas time. We've heard it over and over again. Peace on earth, goodwill towards men. Hosanna in the highest, right? Um, so 
when you talk about the 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 view of God in the Old Testament versus the view of God in the New Testament. It's a God who is far away to some people and judgmental and harsh versus a God who is near to us. But both situations, you know, they could have had a God near to them in the Old Testament if that's what they really wanted. Um, because David had that. Noah had that. Um, different people, the prophets had that. They had God who was near to them uh, in the Old Testament. But it was few and far between. Now, because of Jesus and what Jesus did, God is with us. And now, because of Jesus ascending back to heaven, the Holy Spirit, who can be everywhere, has filled every believer. And that's where you get into Galatians, where we're reading Paul's letter to the Galatians this week, which is just incredible in the in where God takes us, you know what? When we planned out the chapters that we were going to be uh, uh, looking at, you know, you're just trying, I'm trying to match up numbers, you know, I'm trying to, to make everything look, um, to be easily readable in little pieces and, and not be too weird. But uh, some of the passages that have paralleled one another are just incredible between the Old Testament and the New. And this one in Galatians chapter 3 is, is one of those chapters. You know, I looked at chapter 1. I got a whole new message from chapter 1. Um, uh, and one thing you can take away from chapter 1 is that when you look at Solomon's life, he's declaring everything is meaningless, everything's pointless. When you look at Paul, he comes out with this statement in chapter 1, verse 15. But even before I was born, God chose me and called me by his marvelous grace. Then it pleased him to reveal his son to me so that I would proclaim the good news about Jesus to the Gentiles, to the rest of the world, to the people who weren't Jewish. Old Testament in Solomon's life is there's no purpose. There's no meaning. Everything we're doing here is useless. We're all going to die. And then there's judgment after that. But that's not the message that Jesus came to share. That's not the message. It was only an impartial picture of what was going on. Oh yeah, if we reject Christ on this earth, there will be judgment for us. And if people don't want to, if I don't want Jesus in my life, if I don't want him to have anything to do with my life here, he's not going to have anything to do with me when it's time to stand before him in eternity. Okay, and that's where that whole concept that the, uh, the fact of hell and separation and eternal separation from God comes from. If you don't want Jesus now, then you're not going to have him later. It's, it doesn't change once you die. You've made your decision while you're living here on this earth. I want Jesus now, and I want you to want Jesus now. But it also ties into a sense of purpose. You know, suicide. Suicide comes from hopelessness. The belief that if, if, I, if I'm a person that's suicidal, the belief that my situation right now is the way that the rest of my foreseeable life is going to be, or the, or the worst things that I'm imagining uh, beyond this point are the way my life is going to be. There is no hope, there is no future, and that's one of the roots of suicide. It's a, it's, a, it's a ripping away of people's hope. Well, what has this world done? What has our culture done? Our culture has ripped away at the hope of our people. They've tried to erase God. They've tried to erase his commandments. They've tried to erase everything about Jesus. They've made it okay to talk about every faith and every religion on this earth, but made it a crime to talk about Jesus Christ in the public arena. Why is that? And why, as they continue to do that, do suicide rates continue to skyrocket? It isn't because people are being oppressed in the church. It's because the hope of Jesus, the hope of the church, is being ripped away from the people. Oh, you, and here's an example. You tell children, you weren't created in the image of God. You weren't created in the image of an all-powerful creator who has a purpose and a design and a plan for you, just like Abraham, by the way. He wants to use you to bless the nations of the earth for their good and for their prosperity and for their hope and their future and their salvation and their relationship with God. You weren't created for anything like that. That's what the world wants to tell you. You were created accidentally. Matter of fact, we won't even use the word created. You are a cosmic accident. You are a descendant of monkeys, even though you don't have monkey DNA. You were um, basically never supposed to be here, so live to please yourself 
or live to get ahead or live to do whatever you want. These are the things that Solomon was basically saying, because in the end, it's all meaningless. You're going to die and that's it. So what it leads people to believe is my life has no purpose other than the purpose that I give myself. But in the end, there's always that thought that when I die, I think there's no more or I'm completely wrong and there's judgment for the way that I lived my life. And if it was a way that dishonored God and rejected Jesus, well, then that's something that's going to cause eternal pain and eternal hurt to me and to other people who were supposed to believe in Jesus because of me. But as I look at this in Galatians, now you're talking about a God who's near. And the passage that I started out with today was in Galatians chapter 3, and it was I just read verse 29. But I'm going to go back a little bit and go back to verse 24. Paul says this, Let me put it another way. The law, this is the law of Moses, this is the law of the sacrifices, the blood sacrifices for us to be made right with God based upon the death of animals and the shedding of animals' blood. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian. So what he said there is that Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. Jesus lived a perfect life. One of the things that, that Solomon said in Ecclesiastes was, there's nobody that lives on the earth that lives a sinless life. Nobody. But Jesus came and did that so that we could be saved. He came and lived a perfectly submitted, surrendered life to God the Father and then sacrificed himself on that cross so that our sin could be forgiven, so that he could take the punishment for us and die in our place, so that we could receive his righteousness. That was the plan. And that's what Paul goes on to say. He says in verse 26, For you are all children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. What promise is he talking about? Well, the fact that we're heirs means we have a future. God has given us a future. Our future's not hopeless. Our future's not dark. Our future's not dismal, you know, depending on which political party is ruling or whatever. God's people are God's people. And he is going to use us and shine us like lights in the darkness. But here's the thing. The promise he's talking about that he gave to Abraham, if you back up to verse 14, it says that... Um, through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing he promised to Abraham so that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. Abraham was promised the Holy Spirit. All people who believe in Jesus are promised the Holy Spirit too. That Holy Spirit is given to us to empower us to do what God calls us to do on this earth and not be victims of this evil world. You back up a little bit further, what's the other part of what God promised him? In, in verse uh, 8 and 9, it says, So what's more, the scriptures looked forward to this time when God would declare the Gentiles to be righteous because of their faith. God proclaimed this good news to Abraham long ago when he said, quote, All nations will be blessed through you. So all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing Abraham received because of his faith. Abraham was made righteous before the law was given because of his faith. You and I are made righteous if we put our faith in Jesus Christ, the sacrifice that was given to make us right with God. And God uses us to bless the nations of the world. He gives to us his Holy Spirit. He wants to reaffirm that we have a future in Christ, a future that the world cannot take away. And brothers and sisters, I hope you're encouraged by this word. Um, reading about Solomon this week, you know, he had a real struggle with depression and other things it looked like. And the meaningness, meaningness, meaninglessness, I'm going to get that word right, meaninglessness of life. Um, because his relationship with God was based upon a God who's far away. And for some reason, he had a disconnect there that his father, David, didn't have. 
But thank God he sent Jesus, who made the way for all of us to know him here and now and be filled with his Holy Spirit and be a blessing on this earth and to continue to move toward our future, which is eternally with with the Father and with Jesus and with the Holy Spirit in heaven and all the people that believe in him. That's our future. So just remember, everything that happens on this earth is temporary. We'll get to see glimpses of heaven on earth because that's what we pray for. We'll get to live in little bubbles of heaven on earth occasionally and see great things happening, miracles and signs and wonders. But in the end, this earth is not our home. Jesus will take us to our home, the home that he's prepared for us. And that's one other thing that we can look forward to. I love you all, brothers and sisters. I hope you get out to church. I hope you 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 uh, get yourself up in, on Sunday morning. You know our service is at ten thirty in Governor, and you get out there and you worship God with your brothers and sisters. Fear no plague, fear no darkness, fear no governor. Go out and worship God, in Jesus' name, Amen.